Hi everyone, so my name is Ricardo. Uh, I work at CERN in Geneva. Um, I'm a computing engineer there, and uh, CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research, for those uh, that um, are not aware. Um, today I'll try to describe a bit how we've been uh, adopting containers, but especially on the area of how we use Helm to track the application configuration. And um, I have a live, live demo at the end. Uh, this will be the live, last live demo I do this year. I've done quite a few, all worked. This one I had to switch the laptop at the last minute, which is not my laptop, but let's see. Maybe this will still work. Otherwise, uh, I hope it still has enough content. So a uh, bit about CERN. Uh, we are a big physics laboratory uh, that spans the border between France and Switzerland, close to Geneva. Uh, we build uh, um, large scientific experiments to explore, to do fundamental physics research and explore uh, the universe and, and the origin of the universe. We try to answer questions like, uh, what is matter made of? Uh, what is dark energy, dark matter? Why don't we see antimatter? And for this, we build very large machines. This is the largest scientific experiment ever built, the largest Hadron Collider. It's a ring of 27 kilometers where we accelerate protons in the two, diff two beams of protons in different directions, and we make them collide at specific points where we uh, build these large detectors. Uh, to have an idea of the size, you can see the Geneva Airport there on the down right. Uh, so the, it's, uh, it's a tunnel under 100 meters underground. Uh, it's quite large. And we have these four main experiments, CMS, ALICE, LHCB, and ATLAS, where we built these uh, detectors. It looks like this. So this is 100 meters underground, the tunnel. Uh, this is the Large Hadron Collider. It's, a superconduct it's made of superconducting magnets. And to achieve this, we put them uh, at a very low, low temperature, very close to the absol absolute zero, 1.7 Kelvin. And then at this point where we make the protons collide, we build these uh, gigantic machines. Uh, so this is the compact moon sol solenoids, CMS. It's now very comp compact. It's 14 tons, and it's 40, minutes by 40 meters by 40 meters. It fills up the cavern. It's also 100 meters underground. This acts like a gigantic camera where we try to, uh, to understand what happened during these collisions uh, between the protons, and we try to prove theories uh, about uh, the nature of uh, physics of the universe. And uh, basically, we are taking 40 million pictures a, se a second. Uh, it's not really pictures, but you can think of it like pictures. And this is basically a lot of data. So it generates something like one petabyte a second. We have to trim this down so that we can compute. We still generate something like 10 to 15 gigabytes a second when the beam is on. Uh, to produce, to process all this data, we have uh, a large pr private cloud. Um, it has close to 300,000 cores these days. For this talk, you can see all the numbers there. But for this talk, the interesting part is the number of clusters that we, container clusters that we have. We started by offering uh, multiple uh, container orchestration options. Uh, um, Kubernetes is by far the most popular. Uh, Swarm has one use case, which is for GitLab CI, where people have quite a few clusters there. But it's still, uh, uh, it will. A lot of people are also migrating to Kubernetes. And then Mesos and DCOS, we eventually deprecated support because we had very few users. Now, this is the current state. Uh, there's something really interesting at CERN, which is we've been doing computing on large-scale computing for many decades, which means uh, our data center is kind of a history piece of computing. And you can see on the left picture, uh, it's a picture from the uh, 1970s where you can see some ma mainframes, some Kramer main mainframes on the back. Uh, and then eventually the layout of the computer center changed quite a lot to have racks. And here, uh, uh, 2007, we actually had racks with desktop PCs. So this is truly commodity hardware that we would shop uh, on the, on, on where everyone else was shopping. You can also see some old tape silos on the right. We still use tapes for a lot of things, but they are not round anymore. They are all corridors. Uh, eventually, we moved to a more uh, like modern uh, data center, and this is how it looks today. Uh, the building is still quite old, a bit too high, difficult to cool, but uh, we, we have more traditional things. Now, in addition to all this computing that we use for large-scale processing, we also have people doing funny things in their offices. So this is the next computer that Tim Berners-Lee used to when he created the World Wide Web and was the first World Wide Web server. And you can see that this was really an important server because it has a sticker. And in this sticker, it said, this machine is a server, do not power down. And this was basically the message that if 
when cleaning, if someone unplugs the plug, the vacuum cleaner, the web is down. So that's not good. And he was very clear about this. Um, now, with the move to commodity uh, hardware and large scale, uh, and large number of nodes, we had to improve a lot of the automation and efficiency of our systems. And I, I, I will try to describe here uh, a bit uh, some of the parameters that have changed uh, a bit the way we do. So when we had purely physical infrastructure, uh, provisioning nodes could take days, weeks, maybe months if we didn't have the, order, the, the uh, hardware and you had to order it. Um, we had to open a ticket, wait, explain your request, things like this. Uh, maintenance was highly intrusive. We frequently have to update software, the operating system and uh, we had to coordinate with the users when to do this. Uh, deployments and updates, we started using configuration management pretty early, but still in some cases complex applications can take minutes or even hours to update. And utilization is very poor because it's dedicated to a single application even if it's not that big. Then introduction of cloud APIs and especially virtualization, this allowed us to have a very quick way to do provisioning of resources and to kind of separate uh, the hardware procurement from the rest. Uh, the maintenance, in, if the application uh, was designed so that it could be easily live migration, migrate, it, we could do this without uh, uh, being intrusive. Uh, deployment and update was pretty much the same because we were already relying on, on uh, configuration management. Utilization became much better because we can overcommit resources uh, and make sure that uh, the, loads are, are, uh, the nodes are balanced. And then containers, of course, we're all here, so everything is green. And uh, uh, the provisioning now is, is, can take seconds. It, this is true. It's less intrusive because you express on the application how the application can tolerate uh, uh, being moved around. So the orchestrator will do this for you. You can drain nodes and expect that it will deal with uh, moving the application around as appropriate. And then deployment and update uh, became faster and this is what we will cover in the rest of the talk. And the utilization became better mostly because we don't have the extra kernel layer from the virtualization so we can make much better use especially of memory. And then some experiences. So during this transition, uh, it's quite interesting to see how our users uh, deal with this. So when we moved from physical machines to like virtual machines and cloud APIs, we had this question constantly, where is my machine? I, I want to know where my machine is hosted, things like this. So people really treated them uh, as pets and they were very uh, uh, doubtful of the cloud, uh, so they would uh, doubt that the problems they are seeing, they would blame us like as first thing. Sometimes it's true, but sometimes it's not. But still, the transition was pretty easy because the provisioning was much better. Once they were confident with it, they, they were happy to take it. But then the, uh, all the, the, the rest, you still SSH to your node, you can use systemd, you can use whatever configuration management, syslog, everything feels pretty much the same. So the, the the learning curve is not very high to start using this kind of uh, uh, infrastructure. Now to containers, this is much more different. And uh, we have a large number of users and we get a bunch of questions uh, because you express things in a very different way. Uh, you need to know how to use uh, Kubernetes, all the notions on Kubernetes, and it's not Kubernetes only, it's Ingress, it's Helm, it's uh, the CSI drivers, all these things, persistent volumes. So we get a lot of questions and there's a, a steep learning curve. Also, uh, people are still used to going to the nodes, so they want to access the node, and then in our case, we use a immu immutable uh, distribution, so they won't be able to install a package or anything, and they start asking, why can't I do it? And we have to explain how, how to do this. To try, it. so these are the use case, some of the use cases we have. Uh, one of the most interesting ones is the trigger farms. This is the, these farms that filter the data coming in. Uh, to reduce the amount of data we have to process. And this is a very interesting use case because they have to uh, change the application running in the cluster very fast. If there's beam, they want to use the, the, to have the filter running. When the beam is down, they want to, re, to redeploy uh, simulation applications so that they make the best use of these this resources all the time. So we had a lot of iterations with them. We also offer Spark as a service where people can have a Spark service in their own Kubernetes cluster, Kubeflow and distributed uh, machine learning. Um, uh, batch on Kubernetes, HD Condor, and other internal services. Now, to try to make this transition easier, we organize uh, some trainings internally 
We organized workshops from time to time and office hours. We took this idea from the Kubernetes community and this is quite popular. We have uh, end users talking to us but also between each other. Uh, this is really nice. Uh, now, one thing is quite similar. Uh, most of our service managers are used already to use Git to maintain their configuration. Um, we, so now it's called GitOps, uh, but storing and maintaining the versioning of the configuration of your applications in Git is something that we are already used to, to, to doing. And this is kind of a nice opportunity to ease the transition to Kubernetes. Instead of having to learn all, everything about Kubernetes, they can learn how to maintain an application that is running on Kubernetes just by accessing the, the configuration in Git. And with time, they, they get more used and more confident with the internals of, of Kubernetes itself as well. So if you look, in our case, we're using Puppet for all the configuration, the transition to Helm. You have manifests in Puppet. You have Golang, Golang templates uh, in Helm. Uh, yeah, the configuration itself, we have here in, in Puppet. And uh, we have uh, the values files for, for, for Helm. And these are both YAML. So it, like everyone hates YAML, YAML, but it's everywhere. And it's something that everyone knows. So, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite nice. It also has, it's very easy to show the benefits when you are using Puppet to transition to something like Helm because of the speed of uh, deployment and, and iteration uh, on the features. So I'll focus the rest of the talk on Helm and some of the tooling that we have around to, to, to manage all of this. So the first thing I would like to mention is that we maintain our own charts repository, actually repositories. So we, initially we were just packaging charts from upstream and putting them in a local S3. The reason for this is that we want to have full control over them. Uh, then we moved to Chart Museum. It's still uh, using an S3 backend, but actually having an API makes things much easier, also because they provide a nice uh, plugin with Helm Push. Um, and then we have also, uh, th we have two types of repositories. One is what we call CERN repository, where we have all the internal charts. This is like to deploy and maintain the clients for our storage systems and similar. And also, we have mirror charts. These are just uh, synced repos uh, between the upstream uh, uh, charts and our local ones. Um, again, because we want to keep some control. And then we, we have Git, the GitLab CI triggering all the maintenance of the repositories. Uh, if if uh, an upstream uh, repository or chart gets updated, it's synced with our local repos, and then we can we maintain a branch, which is our release branch, where we can, we can trigger a tag, and the tag will run lint, test, and then eventually package and push them to the chart museum, making this new version available to, to whoever wants to use it. Uh, it. You can define the specific version of the Helm chart you want to, to use, and this is really important also because not all users want to move at the same time. The versioning scheme, we take the upstream one and we add an internal one just so that we can iterate also internally if we change something in the system. And then the main, main thing that we do, which also other uh, companies and institutions are doing, is that we don't take individual charts uh, as the deployment unit. So uh, if you take the MySQL chart, we will never deploy the MySQL chart directly. What we do is we have these meta charts or umbrella charts that ex uh, have all the dependencies of the actual deployment you want to do. So say you have an Nginx server with a MySQL backend, what you want to deploy is the two together. So we have this notion of meta charts that are kept in a, a se separate Git repo uh, where you, you define the deployment units or releases as we will call them later. Uh, we started by doing this uh, pretty much uh, um, like by our own, with our own structure. The main point here is the requirements. So this is, uh, I put an example here. In this case, the application only has one requirement, which is Binder Hub. But actually, Binder Hub has many other requirements. And then you have the values file, which is the default configuration. And then you have templates. And in these templates, we can add stuff to, to the charts. So say, for example, in this case, we want uh, Binder Hub is, uh, is, is Jupyter Notebook style uh, deployment. Uh, say we want to support GPUs in the cluster. Uh, the, the upstream uh, chart does not handle this, so we have a specific template uh, to, to configure the GPU setup. And then a pod security policy and anything else we might want here. And now the other interesting part is how to manage secrets. So 
There are basically two options that we considered. One is to uh, build on Kubernetes secrets themselves or similar CRDs. So th there's no easy way or obvious way to plug in external secret providers in Kubernetes. Uh, there's things like Bitnami's sealed secrets that are good, but they are custom resources, which means that if you use them, it kind of breaks most of the upstream uh, Helm charts. And Vault is a fully managed uh, solution, but we don't have a Vault s service in-house. Now, the second option is to not treat, handle the Kubernetes secrets directly, but just to treat secrets as configuration. Uh, what this means is that all the secret configuration is just in the values file, um, and you encrypt that part. So whatever is, is not, you cannot just expose the configuration, then you encrypt it. And uh, there's a tool called Helm, Se Helm Secrets from Future Simple that does this with uh, also supporting SOPs. Internally, we do have a secret uh, storage service, a secret service, as if you wish. And uh, we built a plugin for Helm that is very similar. Um, what it does, it uh, builds on our own identity scheme. So this part is solved. We just rely on, um, uh, it, the tool is called Barbican and it's from OpenStack. And we can just rely on, the, on this identity to manage all the secrets. Uh, the commands look like this. You put Helm, and then you name the release. The name of the release plus the project you're, you're um, configured in uh, will define where the name of the encryption key uh, that will be fetched to manage the secrets. Then you can view, just exposing the contents. You can edit where it decrypts in memory and uh, uh, in encrypts for, for storage again when you save. And then we have wrappers for install, upgrade, and, and lint. Um, you have the workflow there. Uh, we ended up taking the plugin and reusing it also directly with kubectl. Um, now, the m most interesting part, I think, is, is when you start doing the wall flow. So um, um, all of this was kind of manual. A lot of people would trigger things in their GitLab CIs that would uh, push into the cluster, but this means that you have to put the cluster credentials somewhere in, in your uh, uh, Git system or in some system that interacts with Git. Uh, but this was always our end goal, as I mentioned, to try to simplify the life of our users. And then you have here on the top right uh, the command that you usually use, which is Helm install uh, flux, where we use flux cd uh, uh, to, to maintain this. There's other options I will mention also at the end. But flux uh, worked quite well for us. Um, we pass a bunch of default uh, configuration, and you can see wh wh what it does. It basically defines the uh, interval that it syncs back to, to the charts and uh, additional repositories we need. And if you look to the options there, we see git poll interval, which is the polling interval. The URL, the URL is just the, the URL of the git repo holding the meta chart on umbrella chart that it should be deployed locally. And then flux, what it does, it runs in your cluster, and it contacts the, the, the Git repo checking for updates. When it, when it sees an update, it updates a local Helm release, which is a custom resource, and then it has a Helm operator that is listening to, to, to this, uh, that is uh, uh, implementing this uh, custom resource, and then it applies it in, in the cluster. So all the flow is there. Now Flux also does something in addition, which is, when you, you could define a policy on the image versions, where if you update the image via some other mean in, the, in a Docker registry, it would actually uh, write, update the charts directly in Git itself, uh, making like the full cycle. Uh, we, we are not doing this yet, uh, and we are not sure we want to do this. But, so what we do now, we have a completely separate CI to maintain the applications with their, uh, their um, tests. And then when there's a new release, uh, the service manager has to go to the meta chart and update the version of the image directly on the configuration files. And then a Helm release looks like this. You define, um, um, again, the, the Git repo that you want to pick up the Helm chart from, the location of the Helm chart, and I'll try to show it in a bit, um, and then the branch that you want to use. So, by allowing to specify the branch, you can play with a lot of things like having test environments in the GitLab CI. And then on the bottom, you just specify the values for, for, for the application. Um, the structure of a, a meta chart looks like what is on the right. So you have the meta chart on charts, in this case it's called hub, 
and inside you have this requirements file, the values file, and the custom manifest that in the case before was a GPU. And then you have the releases, well, the namespaces, and then you have the releases. So in this case, we maintain two different releases of this uh, application, one for production, one for staging. This allows us to override the default values for each of the environments. And then the only specific thing we have is because we have this specific uh, secrets plugin for Helm, we kind of put the secrets outside of Flux. Uh, this uh, is not ideal, but it allows us to track this uh, secret, uh, the configuration part that is encrypted uh, together with the rest of the configuration while still benefiting from, from Flux. Uh, so this means that whenever you update the secrets, you actually have to update the cluster manual, but this is uh, not that often as the rest of the configuration. Ideally, uh, this should be inside Flux as well, and once it supports um, something like SOPs, uh, we will be able to do this. So now I'll switch to the demo, which I hope it works. So I've never used this laptop. My session is working. Can you do command equal sign and make the factory? Command. Like this? Yeah. Cool. Sorry. I'm Mac and aware. Is it good? Yeah. Cool. OK. So what I will do is. Um, I will start by doing, I'll run this command, okay. So what this will do is like a pre-setup of the cluster. This sets up things like uh, the namespace that we saw there that has to be created before. And as I mentioned, we have to manage the secrets independently. So this is what it does. Um, and then, whoop. so if I look into flux demo. Okay, so this is the command that we saw before, Helm install, and then you pass the default values for Flux with all the default configuration. And then we say that we want a pull interval of one minute here. Uh, yeah. And then the URL of the, the repo using the meta chart. And then we say also that we want to use a specific branch that is called demo. So what I will do is I'll trigger this. If I manage to copy paste. Actually, maybe I have it here. This will be faster. Okay, so this just deployed Flux. Okay, this is, this is I'm actually on, on the CERN uh, system right now, so I'm doing this live, uh, um, so lots of things can go wrong. So we see already that uh, Helm has one release that is called Flux. Uh, while this is going, uh, what I will do is I will show you a bit more in detail what, uh, what I was talking about before. So the first area we saw is this charts hub. This is the meta chart. And if I look into the requirements, I see that I have one requirement in this case, which is Binder Hub. This is actually a quite complex application where it, it while, while it is deploying, it's actually deploying the storage for, for a, a MySQL database. It's deploying ingress, and uh, so it's not, it's not that simple. And then we have also the hub templates. GPU, where we deploy the NVIDIA driver on the cluster. Uh, this is tied to the kernel, of course, so if you are handling GPUs, you will know how much fun this is. And um, so it's basically deploying this also for the cluster to be able to handle GPUs. And then the releases have all this that we saw, the prod, the staging, and then we have this. And inside the, the demo one, we have a Helm release where we define um, the things we said, the, the demo branch it's using, this external configuration to fetch the secret data, and then a bunch of other stuff for, for the configuration of the application. So if I look now, there we go. So now we have, while we were talking, Flux detected, uh, now I have a new, uh, I saw a Helm release in the Git repo, I will deploy it, and then the Helm operator saw the new uh, Helm release and in, uh, applied it to, to, the, to the cluster. So we have two releases here. If we see quickly here, it's still creating. So it's, deploy it's finalizing the deployment. There we go. So now it's validating. So well, we are almost there. And what I will do is I will try to access it. So you can see that it's 404 not found because I opened it because, uh, before deploying earlier. 
Now, if all go well, there we go. I'll have to log in also, so we'll see the new CERN login page. This works. Yeah, so this also takes care of things like single sign-on registration and things like this, so it's quite complete, even if it took only a couple of seconds. And I logged in, and there we go. So we have a full uh, Jupyter uh, notebook application running with a MySQL database and all the fancy whistles. Um, if I would, I could create here my server. And what I would do, I don't know, choose some machine learning thing, and I will go for GPUs, and I could just go and deploy my notebook. Uh, there's another application that I deployed here. I will do a slight cheat here, I assume which is the, the second chart actually has one bug that was introduced recently, so I have to do a quick patch for this to work. But it's a kubectl patch, so it's also quite fast and useful for demos, so this should hopefully work. Okay. There we go. So we also have, this is the main application that relies on a Jupyter Hub uh, deployment behind. And the main application says, welcome to CERN Binder Hub, and it's running on a CERN cluster. Now, what I will try to do here quickly, if I have some time, I will actually edit this. And I will do live from KuCon. And I will edit, commit. And in theory, now if we wait up to a minute, how, uh, Flux will detect this and uh, apply. But we can also trigger it immediately by doing this. No, this. So this is actually triggering, and it saw that there's a new commit, and you can see the commit ID here matching the one we just did here. So this is all looking good. It will take a second. Okay, and now if we do Helm LS, we probably won't see it. Ah, we already see a revision two, so it already applied the change there. Um, if we do now refresh here, there we go, live from KubeCon and the banner. So the change I did was just doing a, a small change in the banner. And that's it for a live demo. So that was the last one of the year, and I'm happy it also worked. <laughs> Although there's always something. Okay, so um, okay, so this was just a, a, a. This is actually how we deployed this application. I'm using a repository that is actually the the the, the stuff we use for production. So it's just a branch on it. So the last bit I'll finalize now. Uh, there's a. We, w we also want to extend this, not only to manage the applications for the end users, but to manage the clusters themselves. So right now, our cluster or orchestration, orchestrator is, is doing all the add-ons also, and this is uh, quite messy. It's a mix of past scripts, Helm charts, and things like this. So we want to move it completely to a Helm release that will be managed by Flux, and maintain two or a couple of environments, production, staging, maybe others, so that people can choose when they register, their, uh, when they create a cluster, they want to use the staging branch or the production branch, and then we'll centrally manage all the add-ons, which, which will uh, simplify a lot the upgrades. And here I put some, some examples, so the dependencies we would manage is things like Flint D and the configuration to push the logs to our Elasticsearch, Prometheus, and pushing the metrics to our central uh, metrics service, uh, traffic for ingress, things like this. So I come to the conclusion. Um, we are relying a lot on Helm, as you could see, uh, and we are now relying on things like Flux, or Argo Flux, uh, as a familiar tool set to handle cont containerized applications. If you think about it, it's basically doing the same we were doing for, for node management, but for containers, which has uh, like all the benefits of using containers instead of individual nodes. Um, we want to remain as with Git as the source of truth, uh, so this allows us to define all the permissions uh, on the Git repositories and uh, uh, separate uh, by groups there. We are already doing it, so this is one of the main reasons why we want to keep doing it. And now for future st steps, uh, 
we want, to, as everyone, to use Hump v3. So this was a demo with v2, but we already started using v3 to get rid of Tiller mostly. Uh, but uh, there are also other nice features. Uh, there's the Helm Hub. Well, uh, it's unclear to us uh, how we will manage this, but the idea would be to have a local replica of, of this, or at least the, the charts we're interested in, uh, as we want to keep some control, and we want to start signing charts. So this is something that uh, we are working on right now. Um, now, uh, automating the, the container image deployments is something that we might reconsider. Um, We'll see how, how this goes. And then the main thing we are working on now is uh, to have clusters not being pets. The same way we were not so happy that people treat nodes as, as pets. Uh, one of the main uh, frustrations is, I don't know, a lot of things can go wrong with the cluster. We do the tools f to recover it, but it also causes frustration. So we're trying to convince people to have uh, uh, this kind of easy way of deploying their application to new clusters so that they can have, uh, they can spread the load and maybe lose some capacity when, when one goes down, but at least keep the, the application always up. And then using Canary and um, uh, service mesh for Canary deployments, uh, we are still not uh, very experienced with the service mesh, but we, we started looking at it. So I don't know if you follow this area, uh, when you choose a tool, like we chose Helm uh, and we chose Flux, there's always the problem of will it last? Uh, is it, will there be something new? Argo CD is a, a good option also, and it's really, it's really good that they decided to merge uh, the effort and call it Argo Flux in a single uh, project now. And with this, I come to the conclusion. I open for questions, but uh, if you want to come and visit us, so we have a visit service that you can visit CERN every day, and until the end of next year, we'll be in a shutdown period doing upgrades, which means you can go underground and visit the experiments, which is really, really cool. And we also have a tech blog that you can see at this uh, URL, and if you have any questions, just contact me also after. Thank you.